The US Marines are training in the cool pre-dawn air at the sprawling Robertson Barracks in Darwin. These are frontline fighters preparing for combat missions wherever the American government chooses to deploy them. One, time. All right, gents, let's go ahead and switch. Sir Coleman. The main thing is it responsibly making those, it's the decision maker that makes a Marine what he is, not really so much his, his physicality, but his, he needs to be comfortable with interpersonal violence. The troops are almost through their six month rotation. Next one in. They're part of an ongoing presence of Marines in the top end. Going down Holland Road all the way back up to Light Horse Drive and then coming back, this ending location is the south side of the football field. You'll see your squad advisors that will be staged there to record your times. Does anyone have any questions or does anyone need a closer look at this map? All right, it's a mile and a half again, max effort uh, on this event. Ah. All right, go. The uh, United States military, anytime we go anywhere and conduct an operation, it's usually as part of a larger coalition force. And so this gives us an opportunity to uh, practice and train to that uh, before we actually need to be employed anywhere. Australian troops have worked with them ever since the Second World War. But the Marines see this as part of a much deeper history. The United States Marine Corps has been in the uh, Asia Pacific region for uh, greater than 100 years. So absolutely, I mean, as we're part of uh, forces that are assigned to the Pacific region, this just gives us a different area to come train and exercise in. We count on our Australian mates being there when, when uh, serious issues are, are at stake. So, uh, uh, and I think um, it goes the other way too. The U.S. wants to double the number of troops in Darwin to two and a half thousand. Of course, a force this size isn't going to be a threat to anybody, but this isn't just about the presence of U.S. troops up here in the top end. This is about the symbolism, and it says to the rest of the world, and to China in particular, that the Australian and U.S. militaries are working in lockstep together. When he was here back in 2011, President Obama set out his Pivot to Asia strategy and cast it with missionary purpose. We are saying together, proudly, yes, we have the strength for the burden laid upon us, and we have the power to protect and guard our own here in the Asia Pacific and all around the world. Our commitment that was the most potent symbol you can imagine of the beginning of a time where America was seeking Australia's support to push back against China's challenge to American primacy. Aussies and Americans like you. Military analysts say President Obama's target is clear. He wants to contain China, and that poses a profound challenge for Australia. This is an attempt by the United States to demonstrate to Australia, to the rest of the region, and to China, and to Americans, that Australia is there at, on America's side as it pushes back against China's challenge to American primacy. It locks us into a fight with China. That, that's certainly what the United States would like. And they want us to see ourselves as deeply committed to supporting the United States in whatever the United States does to resist China's pressure. And of course, many Australian political leaders and many Australian voters would think that's inherently a good idea, but they have to really think through what does that mean? Where does that lead? Is it going to work? A short drive away from Robertson Barracks is the Darwin Port. It's a quiet morning, only a few vessels have docked. Port really services the whole of North Australia. Export of bulk minerals, export of, um, uh, of other food products growing. You know, it's a live cattle, large live cattle port, um, and a lot of uh, product coming in, into Northern Australia comes into the North, a lot of fuel to run Northern Australia. It is Darwin's economic umbilical cord to the North. Nationally, China is our biggest trading partner, taking almost a third of Australia's exports. The Territory Government has also turned to Chinese money to develop the port, 
Late last year, a Chinese company called Landbridge won the half a billion dollar lease to run it. Terry Darwin isn't a, a, a massively busy harbour and this looks an incredibly sophisticated system. Oh, most definitely. Look, it's, it was built around growth. We certainly, with the new LNG facility coming online, is going to significantly complicate the, the picture here. They, these are very big vessels operating in the harbour. Handing the port to Landbridge was hugely controversial. The government said it just wanted a good investor. FERB, the Foreign Investment Review Board, was aware of the sale, as was Defence. Critics said the deal compromised national security for the sake of the economy. I think uh, many people in Washington were worried that Australia's willingness to allow a Chinese company uh, to, to take that lease showed how deeply Australia's economic future was being embedded with China's, and I think more than the narrow intelligence concerns, they were worried broad, more broadly about what that meant about the direction Australia is going. There is a concern in the United States about how far Australia is being drawn into the Chinese economic hemisphere. We, um, at government level, with FERB, with Defence, no concerns have been raised and consistently have not been raised. Um, I can only, we seem to have been caught in the middle of some, some other debate. Um, and, um, you know, I, I like to, and we like to focus on, uh, you know, the actual conversations we have with people in authority, which, which are very positive, um, rather than focusing, frankly, on what, what's in the press. Across the bay on the edge of the city is the Fort Hill Wharf. At one end, cruise ships board their passengers. At the other end, Navy vessels berth. Do you understand why, in principle, Australians might be concerned about the potential security risk for a Chinese company owning and operating a facility that is also shared by the Australian Navy? Of course I understand um, the need for the Australian government to think about um, where, it, where it invites foreign investment. Um, I guess my point is that was done very thoroughly in our case. And every time, uh, each of those bodies at a high level has said that they have no concerns and they're, in fact, very comfortable uh, with our involvement. That tension between economics and national security in the port is a local version of a national question. This is the first time in our history where our biggest trading partner is a strategic rival of our principal ally. So this introduces a whole level of complexity into our strategic situation, which we've never known as a country before. Are you concerned about the tension between our, those economic and strategic interests here? No, I believe that we are able to balance those um, competing interests as other countries do in many other circumstances. Um, we are an economy that's built on foreign direct investment, so we're able to manage these issues as well as our relationship and alliance with the United States. Except that it does keep coming under stress. It wasn't just Landbridge, it was also the Osgrid decision. It's, there's been, obviously there's been controversy around the sale of the Kidman properties. And so frequently we're seeing this dilemma, how much, do we, how much Chinese investment do we accept and, and, and at what risks to our own national security? Well, I think we risk overstating it. Um, it's about 30% of our foreign direct investment, which is valued at about $3 trillion, comes from the United States. Uh, China's is about 2.5%. So, Darwin represents a dilemma. For more than a decade, Chinese trade has made us rich, and ever since the Second World War, we've depended on the US to keep us safe. And that presents us with an unprecedented challenge. Australia sits at the intersection of these two great powers. The problem for us is that the historical forces driving each of them are far greater than anything we can possibly control. So we need to find out how those forces might play out. Those forces came together at last month's G20 meeting in Hangzhou, the first ever in China. It was a historic moment for the Chinese President Xi Jinping, a chance to use the grand theater of a global summit to assert China's newfound power. And to welcome the world's most powerful figures on his own terms. For the first time since the rise of the Communist Party, uh, Xi Jinping sees himself as at least the equal of uh, the US president. 
So for Xi Jinping, there's no question that uh, he can talk to the most powerful figure in the free world on level terms. That gives Xi extraordinary clout. When he talks, the world has no choice but to listen. For decades, China was content to focus inward in a policy known as hide and bide, building power and waiting to assert it. But Xi Jinping has shifted gear to what he's called the China dream. For Xi Jinping, he sees himself as the person who um, can translate China into uh, the next superpower of the world. The Chinese dream mantra is that by the, the year 2049, the centenary of the establishment of the People's Republic, China will have closed the gap with uh, the US, uh, both economically and more importantly, militarily, uh, without which uh, the Communist Party cannot justify its um, status as the perennial ruling party, and Xi Jinping himself cannot justify his um, place in history as the Mao Zedong of the 21st century. When Malcolm Turnbull met Xi Jinping at the G20 summit, he acknowledged China's new role as an economic superpower. The agenda that you've set recognises that the keys to ensuring strong economic growth in, in both our countries, in all the nations, are trade, open markets, innovation, uh, investment, especially in infrastructure, enabling infrastructure. As China's economic clout grows, so does its political influence. Over the past three years, donors linked to China have given at least $2 million each to Labour and Malcolm Turnbull's coalition. We've also seen a lot of attention being focused on China's attempts or perceived attempts to influence Australian politics, including Chinese donations to political parties. What do foreign donors expect in return? Well, I think we have to also put this in perspective. A number of these companies are in fact incorporated in Australia. A number of them are run by dual citizens or Australians. And I would imagine that they make donations to political parties for exactly the same reason other people make donations to political parties. Businesses donate to the party that they think provides the best business environment for them to operate. The outgoing US ambassador expressed his concern about those donations. That's a matter for the US ambassador. But I believe that we have a relatively open and transparent system where donations to political parties are disclosed, they are audited, but they're made to a party. They're not made to the individual. And I don't think anybody would suggest that the coalition's foreign policy on China has been altered in any way over a long period of time. It seems odd to do a story about China without visiting there. We made repeated attempts to get approval to enter the country, and each time we were rebuffed. Of course, one of the biggest criticisms of China is that lack of openness and transparency. And so we've had to come to the next best thing, and that's Hong Kong. For Chinese, this former British enclave represents more than a century of colonial humiliation, but also the entrepreneurial spirit that's powered China's economic miracle. For all the Western high-rise gloss, the culture is still deeply rooted in a world view far from European tradition. In a street market, Mao Zedong and Confucius share the shelves with Lenin watching nearby. The Communist Party is encouraging a resurgence of all three. Both um, Confucianist patriarchal values and Leninism serve the same purpose, and that is to focus all power um, at the hands of the party and also to ensure uh, the party status as what Xi Jinping calls the perennial ruling party so that there will be no challenge uh, from other political forces in China. The Communist Party is taking those old ideas and developing a sense of national pride rooted in rich Chinese cultural history. 
When Chinese look at their history of art, what they see is evidence of a great civilization that dominated the world for over a thousand years in everything from science to economics and military affairs, and at a time when Western Europe was nothing more than a medieval backwater. So for them today, it isn't so much about China rising as about China re-establishing its historic place in the world. And that place is driven by commerce. Just look at Hong Kong Harbor. In 1980, China's exports were equivalent to 6% of America's exports. By 2014, it was 106%. Back then, China's foreign currency reserves were one-sixth the size of America's. By 2015, they were 28 times larger. And in 1980, China's economy was smaller than the Netherlands. By 2014, it grew by an amount roughly equal to the Dutch economy. Until the 1840s, uh, China had the largest GDP in the world. So uh, for Xi Jinping, um, it's important to tell the people that after one and a half century of um, humiliation at the hands of the colonial powers, uh, China is now on the rise again. China uh, is um, determined to uh, reassume its uh, status as the middle kingdom of the world. In historical terms, not to blame China in any way, but as a rising power rises relative to a ruling power, one sees, in effect, a rising power syndrome in which the rising power thinks, well, I'm bigger and stronger. So my interests deserve more weight. I deserve more say. We're flying out of Hong Kong across the South China Sea. This is the theater where Beijing seems determined to test its power. About a third of the world's trade, more than $5 trillion worth, passes through here every year. That's including the bulk of Australia's trade. It is one of the world's most strategic waterways. It's a little bit hard to see down through the clouds, but just to the south of us, there's a patch of water that's claimed by no less than three countries in the region. To understand why this is one of the most contested areas in the world, have a look at this map. Malaysia claims territory along its coast. Brunei is arguing for a wedge into the contested waters. The Philippines argues that a sweep of the sea to its west is its territory. Vietnam also has a large claim. And China uses what's known as the Nine Dash Line to scoop out its claim to more than 90% of the sea. And beneath it all, there are at least four large oil and gas fields. China says its claim is based on hundreds of years of history. For the near term, they want to become the final arbiter of um, events in the Asia-Pacific region. And for that to happen, they have to marginalize uh, American power. So uh, the assertion of military power in the past decade, uh, the building of nuclear submarines, and now at least two new aircraft carriers, I think, are uh, devoted to this goal of um, at least minimizing American influence in the Asia-Pacific region. What do you assess is China's aim in the region? Is it to push out to displace that US dominance? I think it's to uh, push out anybody's dominance and replace it with uh, a, a, this inflated um, Chinese concept of their rightful sphere of, uh, of, of influence. The contested sea is full of coral atolls that disappear at high tide. A few years ago, China quietly began building them into islands, turning claim into possession. Only the Chinese know what's going on in the reefs they control, but the Americans have been watching closely. These pictures are from a Navy surveillance flight last year. The crew heads towards Fiery Cross Reef in the Spratly Islands, a chain claimed by both the Philippines and China. Other satellite photos from just a few years ago show that Fiery Cross was a pristine reef with only a tiny construction on the southeast tip. But a sequence of images over a 15-month period shows how Chinese crews have covered it with sand. They built it into a mini town, complete with a harbour, extensive buildings, a sports ground, 
and a runway three kilometers long. In April 2014, a tiny sandbar was the only thing above the waterline in Gavin Reef. Six months later, it was a fully fledged island with a harbor bringing in construction materials. The latest images from last month show a well developed facility. China uh, quite stealthily try to make them look like they have civilian aspect too. So that these are what you call dual purpose complex or facilities. So China could put malls, uh, some civilian uh, structures there, but clearly uh, they are also uh, convertible into full-scale uh, military uh, installations. China could use this. China analyst Richard Haydarian has been closely studying the South China Sea projects. The technology that they're employing here and the scale of the reclamation and construction activities, what China is doing is incomparable. It's a whole different league onto itself. Uh, without this facilities, China... The Chinese aren't the first to build islands here, but the speed and scale of the work is unprecedented. And I think it's perhaps these satellite images that have really put the South China Sea issue on the global radar. I think prior to that, a lot of countries were treating it as some small, obscure uh, territorial spats that has been there for a century and flares up w once in a while. But once these images came out, it really uh, drove home the, the, the idea that China is maybe looking at dominating an international water, arguably the most important international water in the world. Five trillion dollars of trade, 10% of global fisheries uh, resources are there, significant amount of hydrocarbon resources, and three times more energy transport than the Suez Canal. The Chinese have never said a great deal about what they're doing. They've often said that they're not trying to militarize the region. Do the images that we're seeing from the South China Sea substantiate that? Oh, no, I think it's quite plain that they're trying to militarize the region. They would argue, with some legitimacy, that the United States is doing the same. That is, that both sides have, by their military deployments and activities, tended, to, tended to, to make the South China Sea disputes a theatre of strategic competition between them. And, you know, I, don't, I think it's hard for the United States to argue that China is the only side militarising the issues when they've had two carrier battle groups deployed in the South China Sea over the last few months. So I think, I think in fact, both sides are trying to exploit the situation in the South China Sea. We've come to Manila, on the other side of the South China Sea. The Filipino capital swelters in monsoonal humidity. Three years ago, the Philippines took China to the permanent court of arbitration in The Hague to decide who owns a host of the disputed reefs. We're going to meet the man who launched the case, the then foreign minister, Albert Del Rosario. Ambassador Del Rosario. Pleasure. Pleasure to meet you. Thank Pleasure. you so much for coming for going to talk. Uh, thank I you really for appreciate coming it. yourself over here. No, thank Your you. Your first visit to Manila. Ambassador Del Rosario insists they'd already tried and failed to negotiate a deal directly with China. The core issue was uh, China had taken the position of indisputable sovereignty over nearly the entire South China Sea, as represented by their nine dash line, which, by the way, is an excessive claim and is uh, in clear violation of uh, international law. China has violated its obligations under UNCLOS to protect and preserve the marine environment. In July came the verdict. The Philippines won almost every aspect of its case. China has no legal basis for its claims based on history. Well, I think the assertions of, of China uh, were, uh, were uh, contradictory, unlawful, and violation, gross violation of international law. Filipinos celebrated a historic victory, but China rejected the verdict outright. Uh, it's final, it's uh, non-appealable, and uh, we need to uh, have the ruling apply so that uh, we can have a rules-based uh, uh, solution to the situation. Yeah, but you still don't have access to that zone. Your fishermen still can't fish out. Well, we're working on it, Peter, and uh, we, we hope that the international community uh, will help us in... Uh, in uh, 
abiding by the ruling. Let's face it, we do not live in an era with international law, with international court can decide everything, every country should obey. Western countries sometimes, from time to time, also do not take the, uh, uh, the, the, the ruling uh, 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 seriously. But when you put aside a ruling like that and you have negotiation, inevitably a country with the resources that China has, both economic and uh, military resources, it makes it impossible for smaller countries to negotiate from a position of strength. They have to accept what China imposes on them. But the they? point is the Chinese do not think that way. They think these countries backed by by strongest country in the world with uh, uh, the, the strongest military, that is, of course, the United States. Historically, the Philippines' greatest ally has been the United States. It reopened Subic Bay to American warships earlier this year. But the new Philippines president has made a series of provocative statements, including declaring an end to further joint military exercises with the US. They indicate that the regional balance of power is shifting. When a country like the Philippines faces pressure from China and the Philippines seeks American support and the, and the United States says, no, we don't want to go to war with China over this one, and that's what's been happening, that makes America look weak and therefore makes China look strong. It's a zero-sum game. This struggle over the South China Sea isn't just about politicians and diplomats and military strategists. It's also having a devastating impact on one of the world's most important and productive fisheries. You can see the effect of that about half a day's drive north of Manila. Masinloc is the town closest to Scarborough Shoal, the contested area nearest to the Philippines. The fishermen here have been sailing there for generations, and they know it well. There are corals uh, around, and then the center is a diff. Uh, when the storm is coming, if you uh, come to shelter inside, you can ship if you can come in here, because uh, the, this is like a uh, lagoon. lagoon. And it's good for fish. What, yes, what do you catch here? Uh, big fish like this, uh, all kinds of, of, kind of fish. coral reef fish. So ships can come uh, in? Yes, sir. Nats Quaresma uh, is the head of the local fishermen's association. They used to go spearfishing in Scarborough, picking off only the biggest fish. But that's no longer possible. The Chinese authorities have stopped the Filipinos from going there. It seems that they're doing some drilling inside the shoal. I feel that they may be drilling for oil. That is why they are preventing us from going in. We might see other things that they may be doing. Now that the Chinese have closed Scarborough, we're heading to one of the local fishing grounds with nothing more than a rusty compass and well-honed instinct to guide us. Those fisheries are overcrowded now and competition is fierce. There's a concept in conservation called the tragedy of the commons. And the tragedy is that whenever you have a resource shared amongst a group of competitors, even though everybody knows that to overexploit that resource would be to kill it off, because nobody trusts their rivals to do the right thing, and rather than being played for a mug, they still take as much as they possibly can. And the result is that you end up killing that resource. And that's what's happening here. Are you worried about the future of fishing industry here? Yes, that's a big fear for us. The uh, fishing industry has changed and because of the ban, now the fishing areas are denser. So we fear that eventually the uh, fishing industry will collapse. After several hours of work, at last something takes the bait. A skipjack that had been attacked by a shark on the way up. It was the only thing they caught. Eventually, the crew gives up and heads back to shore empty-handed. The plight of these fishermen adds pressure on the Philippine government to push back in its dispute with the Chinese. 
The fishermen don't want to trigger an international incident, but they also want their livelihoods back. It seems that personally I cannot really do anything about it. Everybody should follow the tribunal's decision, so I feel our country does not have any power to force China to leave, but our country can talk to all its allies to help us enforce that decision. Local activists are taking to the sea and confronting the Chinese, guarding Scarborough Shoal. So as Filipino citizens, this is about our sovereignty. In a local Manila cafe, Joy Ban Egg shows me what happened when she and some friends tried to reach it earlier this year. All right, this is one of the videos taken at Scarborough Shoal last uh, June 12. She represents a group called Kalyan Atinito, dedicated to defending the shoals from what she sees as an invasion. So see, the point here is we cannot rely on anyone at the end of the day. At the end of the day, it will be the Philippines who will stand alone. If it will be our blood that we have to shed over this thing, then that will be the case. Are you prepared to shed blood over this? Oh yes, definitely. The first sale that we made last uh, December, we were ready for any eventuality. We were ready for any confrontation. But you could easily trigger a confrontation that could well spill out into something much bigger. And there's no way that the Philippines, with its very meagre resources, could possibly confront the Chinese. Yeah, we don't want war. Uh, nobody wants war. But at the end of the day, if we don't resolve it, it will really end with war. So we want a peaceful resolution of this. So the only way is to call for unity among nations to enforce this. On the other side of the Pacific in Washington, D.C., American analysts are trying to work out what the Chinese are doing and how to respond. Before he retired, Admiral Dennis Blair led the U.S. Pacific Command and then became National Intelligence Director. What's your assessment then? Of My assessment is they've, they've built a logistics base. There's an air station, a port, uh, a lot of storage storage facility could be turned into a military outpost uh, pretty quickly. Does it worry you about what that represents? It does, but uh, also it is only of limited military use since it's so isolated and serious. Serious war fighting, uh, neutralizing it is probably 10 or 15 minutes worth of, worth of work. Are you concerned about the potential for conflict? Well, at a minimum, those set up sort of a contentious uh, um, headbutting uh, thing in the region. Uh, both the United States and China, I'm, I'm convinced, want to do not want to go to war. But nonetheless, they want to um, demonstrate uh, support for their uh, for the, what they think are their rights and responsibilities in the region. Meanwhile, China is investing heavily in its navy. It will be decades before it can match American military power. In the meantime, it's flexing its muscles with exercises in the South China Sea and releasing official video to show it. China really has a land-based attitude that that should be their territory uh, in which there should be no military force of any other kind. It should only be occupied by China. Uh, the United States has the view that these are international waterways which for the United States for years have been uh, what we have used to uh, reach our allies, to support our interests, sometimes by w war if necessary. And if the Chinese had their way and uh, the entire South China Sea uh, were their own territory, which they could uh, uh, keep the United States and other armed forces from, from operating, it would be absolutely intolerable for the United States and we're not going to allow it to happen. And those two positions are very difficult to reconcile. Very difficult to reconcile, yes, yes. These pictures from two weeks ago show joint exercises with Chinese and Russian forces, raising the temperature in the tropical sea even further. When I'm in uh, discussions with Chinese, I'm incredibly righteous from the American point of view, and my Chinese interlocutors are very righteous from their, their point of view. I think there's a notable inability for 
the two of us to understand what's going on on the other side and to find, um, find compromises that we can both live with. Uh, we seem to have to deal by a series of, uh, of concessions or wins uh, in the, in the uh, relationship. And that's the kind of relationship that can sort of escalate up over time. And lead to conflict. And lead to, and lead to conflict, yes, yeah. A misunderstanding and then fear and conflict. To test China's resolve, the American Navy has been running its surveillance flights. On this flight last year, over the radio, came a warning. Uh, this is the Chinese Navy, this is the Chinese Navy. Please go away quickly. I mean, United States military aircraft conducting lawful military activities outside national airspace. I am operating with due regard as required under international law. Foreign military aircraft, this is Chinese Navy. You are approaching our military alert zone. Leave immediately in order to avoid misjudgment. On the water, the United States has also been running operations in the South China Sea to assert their rights under international law. Admiral Blair believes there should be joint exercises with Australia. I think Australian and American ships should exercise together in the South China Sea, sh showing that when they, when they uh, need to, they will send their armed forces uh, in international airspace and water. So yeah, I think they ought to uh, join uh, exercises with the American uh, vessels in that part of the world. The United States has never asked us to take part in um, exercises that would uh, go within disputed territorial waters, um, and we will continue to do what we've always done, and that is uh, traverse the South China Sea, exercising our rights of um, passage um, over water through the skies. Australia has been carrying out um, operations in the South China Sea for many years and will continue to do so. The US established its dominance over the Pacific in World War II. The War Memorial in Washington DC recalls the key battles that helped create America's network of alliances with states like Japan, South Korea and the Philippines. But China's challenge to US supremacy risks upending the 70-year-old balance of power. I would say, in general, when a rising power threatens to displace a ruling power, you're in a period, you're in a, in a condition of severe structural stress in which lots of things can go wrong, not because somebody wants a war, not because somebody intends a war, but because one thing leads to the other. Who should rule the South China Sea? Xi Jinping thinks China should. And the Americans say, no, for 70 years, we've been there as the predominant power. We think that the rule-based system is a good system. Now, can you imagine that leading to a conflict that then escalates to a war that neither of would have chosen? Unfortunately, I can. But China watchers think the risks of confrontation are overstated. We may ask, what's the ideological difference in today's world between China and the United States? Of course, there's some cultural differences. There's differences in the political system, but there's no fundamental objective on the Chinese part or on the US part to try to defeat other or see the other as a pure enemy. No, the fact is we see that we have a lot of common interests which really prevail interest in the global economy. If Chinese economy is not doing well, U.S. suffer. Same things, U.S. economy is not doing well, China will suffer. Not far from the World War II memorial, veterans and their families pay their respects in the summer heat to the victims of another conflict. This is a monument to the Korean War. It was the last time China and the United States fought one another. Back then in 1950, America led a United Nations force to support South Korea after the Chinese back north invaded. China then came to the aid of its allies. The lesson from the Korean War is that while neither the Americans nor the Chinese necessarily wanted conflict, both were driven into a war in a third country by historical forces 
that were beyond the control of either of them. If it was true back then, it's also possible today. I don't believe that either China or the United States or any other nation in our part of the world wishes to see conflict. And so we all call for de-escalation of tensions, for people to respond peacefully, to negotiate their differences. The United States is the indispensable security power in the Indian Ocean, Asia Pacific, and has been for decades now. And the economic advancement that all countries have benefited from, including China, is as a result in part of the presence of the United States as a security guarantor. But there is something fundamentally incompatible with that, isn't there? Because if China continues, China's economy continues to grow and it continues to spend a proportion of its, of its GDP on defence, as, as every country does, then it will become also the strongest military power in the region. It will displace the United States. And where does that leave us? Well, I don't believe that it will displace the United States anytime soon. History tells us that any shift in the balance of power between big countries brings instability, uncertainty, and the risk of conflict. I think at the moment the trend is very plainly towards escalating strategic rivalry, uh, because I think both sides do have fundamentally incompatible views of their respective roles in the Asian order. China wants to lead the Asian order uh, and take America's place, and America wants to preserve its place and keep China in a subordinate position. Those views are not irreconcilable. They could sit down and do a deal. I think that would be a perfectly possible and very desirable thing for them to do, but they haven't started doing that yet. So what I think we're looking forward to, unless something very big changes, is a pattern of escalating strategic rivalry, which makes Australia's choices tougher and tougher.